I can finally let go I am free, free I can let my true self show I am free Yes, and all this time has been here inside of me I can finally let go I am free Yeah, I think it starts for me back in university. I was uh, at university for 10 years, undergraduate and graduate, and then uh, during the middle of that, as I began um, getting ready for graduate school, I started to get more into psychology and uh, new age books and self-help books and begin to open my mind towards healing and opening towards truth or ultimate reality. And then uh, the last few years was spending a lot of time in the psychology, philosophy, religion section of the library, delving into deeper questions, becoming more spontaneous so that I could just formulate a question in my mind and then pop open a book in the library and start getting answers in very synchronistic ways and I was kind of amazed at how that all worked. Instead of just grinding everything out, reading books from covers to covers, it was more you know, being more selective in my questions and then popping books open and getting answers. So by the time I got off the, the wheel of academia and I didn't know what I was stepping onto, what was my next wheel. Uh, that was the summer when A Course in Miracles came into my life and it was out at the Humanistic Psychology Conference in San Diego, California and uh, I didn't go there to find A Course in Miracles. Uh, I think the course came to me then, and I canceled a lot of the workshops uh, when I was meeting with a couple students of Tara Singh and watching a videotape, uh, a DVD uh, that had been done, and the teacher Tara Singh was on the DVD and was speaking a lot of ideas that I had pondered myself and were in my mind, but I had never spoken them to anyone, so it was a very profound experience. And then I bought The Course in Miracles at that point and uh, felt this feeling that my whole life would be changed forever, that I would be doing things and experiencing things that I had never done before in my life. And the Course seemed like an answer to a prayer, like if I had an unspoken prayer for the fastest way to clear my mind of all judgment, that that was like the unspoken prayer. and then. When the Course came into my life, it was like an answer to that prayer. And so I felt like, well, this is it. It's in English. It, it uses the, the education that I had, psychology and education and Christian terms. And I was raised in the Christian faith as a Protestant. So it was really in my language. So I really felt like I had no excuses. I could just go for it at that point. Really go for it. Yeah, it's a, a book of over 1,200 pages that's a very practical tool for spiritual awakening. It uh, has, as I said, terminology that uses, pulls from three main disciplines, which is Christianity and psychology and education. It's written with very contemporary words and it's uh, from a source that is beyond time, leading the mind to a point, a leaping off point, to, you might say, leap back into the present moment and then follow that gateway into the eternity, and which is really what spirituality is, is about, finding God or finding the divine within the mind. And uh, so it's got three books. Uh, basically the text gives you the theoretical foundation, and then the workbook is your practical application, your laboratory for putting all the principles into practice in your daily life and experience. And then there's a manual for teachers for those that feel guided to uh, to teach this course as part of a, a calling, like a function as a, a teacher of God or a miracle worker or a minister of God. And uh, those are all just symbols. It's not like you get certified <laughs> in A Course in Miracles. Uh, some people do have certification <laughs> programs, but it's actually a, a book that that helps put you in touch with your inner guide or the Holy Spirit or the, the higher self and, 
And that's what it did for me. It helped me make that connection. I think when I first picked the book up, I, I felt like I was called into a function, and I didn't know how that would unfold. And so I just was, knew that there was a preparation phase that came first. And that the spirit is very practical. I was asked to go back to the relationship that I was in, in Cincinnati, go back. Uh, I had student loans that had to get paid off. I uh, was guided to a job and a series of jobs which helped kind of whittle away at the pride of, of thinking I knew something about anything. After 10 years of education, that's a problem of thinking you know something. So that was a whittling away. Uh, then I was guided to a, a conference that was being held in Cincinnati at a retirement community. And I went there, and it was a, a student of Tara Singh's that was leading it. And then I met. And that was like fa another phase of starting to let the Holy Spirit speak through me. Whereas the beginning it was opening to listen to the voice speaking to me. And then phase two was allowing the Spirit to speak through me. So that was an important phase as well. And, and I did have a, a job where I was teaching psychology at an art institute. And I was asked by the Spirit then to let the Holy Spirit teach the class through me. Four hour classes. No uh, syllabus, or we had a syllabus, but uh, no uh, lesson plans. So every day I would have to go in and spontaneously for four hours let the spirit. And I use many uh, techniques that I still use today in teaching. But that was the, the primer, that was the preparation for my function of traveling around the country and the world and teaching A Course in Miracles. In traditions, you, you hear about guidance and prophets receiving guidance and, and letting the, a voice speak through them. Even in the ancient days, the Old Testament of the Bible, they were like a voice in the wilderness. Uh, you know, Ezekiel and Isaiah and some of these, you know, prophets. So this has been going on for a long time in many different cultures and traditions. And it's just the spirit, the light of wisdom and understanding that's beyond this perceptual world that's using the words of this world and the languages of this world to reach the mind that's asleep and dreaming that has forgotten the light of heaven or the light of nirvana. And so it's, it's using all these symbols and, and tools and words and images to help the mind go back and to wake up from the dream. And how to listen to it, it's a lot of, you have to be ready and willing. <laughs> Uh, sometimes if, even if you're willing, and many people I meet are, say, I'm very willing, I really want to hear this voice, but I'm not hearing it. And you might say it takes a certain level of readiness as well, because the ego is, uh, is very terrified of this voice. The ego uh, is against this voice, you might say, because by listening to this voice it will undo the ego. And the ego, one of its main uh, traits or tendency is survival, and it wants to, to exist, even though it doesn't really have existence. It wants to seem to exist, so it avoids uh, hearing this voice and uh, tries to use many different tricks and techniques to, to not hear this small, still voice that's there really for everyone to, to wake up. Well, distractions of the world, um, or you might say that in the Course of Miracles, it says that the ego always speaks first. So it wants to kind of get in there first and, and round out the small, still voice with its loud clamoring. And 
sometimes you hear people talk about this chatter or this judgment that's always going on in their mind or like a radio station that has static. And it's just called the Holy Spirit in A Course in Miracles, you know, in other traditions it goes by many different names. Yeah, I think there could be some practical steps. I mean, it, it varies. The curriculum is highly individualized, but, but for some uh, techniques such as uh, journaling or um, different techniques that help clear away the blocks, uh, because as long as you have blocks and resistance, So when you hear that from the Course, then uh, it reminds me of, of a gathering we did here last night where one of the questions during the breaks was, uh, before I leave, uh, tell me, can you give me a quick uh, summary of how did I get in touch with this Holy Spirit and how do I listen to it? And I said, well, initially when I couldn't hear the voice, I would get intuitions, feelings, like a little feather tickling in my heart that let me know this is the way to go, this is the right path. Um, I just took the parameters off of my mind and I just said, well, all right, I'm not hearing the voice consistently and clearly, so I'll just... in a restaurant or music, music coming in into an elevator or uh, music coming on the radio in a restaurant where I'm eating, you know, it's just opening the, taking the parameters off and saying, it can be very frustrating if you if you put all the pressure on, I've got to hear the voice, and you're not hearing a voice, then you may, it just shuts you off and closes you down. True. So I've just, that was one of the main things I did, was I just opened up. Right. And I had a friend who would take me, we would go out to eat, we would have heart-to-heart -heart talks, and then right in the middle of the heart-to-heart -heart talk, he, he would point his finger up to the speaker right above us in the restaurant, and the very time he would do that, he would say, listen and the song would be singing to us directly of what we were speaking of. And it was friends like that that were very helpful to pay attention, you know, right. aware. Yeah, it's, it's error. You might say that, in one sense we could say it's the belief in separation from God. And so it's not only a belief, but it's a belief system and a thought system that is closed, that uh, it's, it's basically separation and, and anger and hatred and death. And uh, it certainly doesn't mean uh, the mind well. It's, it's basically a death wish. You know, Freud had, had called Thanatos in psychological terms, a death wish, and that's what the ego is, it's a death wish. So there's nothing helpful about it. Uh, a wish for death or murder, you know, doesn't really have anything good about it. And therefore it needs to, you might say, the, the spirit uses what the ego made in hate. Uh, the spirit uses to retranslate the world retranslate the symbols and the images into something that's helpful.
that that's just a phase. Uh, the joy that I experience is, of course, that it's not real, and therefore you can never really understand the ego because it's insanity. So you kind of you can't. the tricks and then to see that that the ego and its tricks and its world none of them are real and that's when you experience the peace and the happiness and joy the phase one is exposing so uh, we were talking when we went out to the cafe yesterday uh, and you were saying it to, to be authentic to give your mind permission to feel everything feel all the feelings, not discriminate, not repress, not deny. It's almost like there's something that's buried and, and the reason it's buried is because it's been kept down, it's been kept hidden. So the first step is to open the doors, uh, so to speak, of your mind and, and let it come up. And sometimes this doesn't look or feel pretty. Uh, so that's part of So now you're opening the wound and saying, uh, let the light, let the air <laughs> come in to heal the wound. Let, let the, the error come to the surface. And then uh, you reach a phase, I call it like a, the, the happy dream or uh, becoming a happy learner where you realize that the lesson is always happiness. To feel the joy and the peace and the love and the happiness, that's the lesson. reason for for anger or fear or pain or upset of any kind that nothing upsetting has any kind of reason or justification because all is perfect and all is love so the phase that's then when you get to get into forgiveness which is not first finding errors and then figuring out how to overlook them it's really getting into an awareness that there there is no error that, that you have overlooked the error. How do you do that? Well, you have to do it with the spirit. There's not a human being uh, that can overlook that because the human construct is part of the error. So that's why you have to join with the spirit. And with that willingness, you get better and better at eliminating or clearing the mirror of the mind. And when you cl clear the filter, then you don't see the error anymore because the error was in the filter. And so there's not, it's not a matter of fixing people or changing the world, it's just a matter of cleaning your own mind, clearing the filter, and then once the error is cleaned, then uh, just the blazing light reflects and you see the light and love all around you because that's all that's left. <laughs> that's all there is. Well, you might say that, that the experience that, that the world is transitory or temporary and, and therefore from the standard of eternity uh, it is unreal and an illusion, you might say that's the, the final realization. And so uh, really it doesn't help you to use affirmations or platitudes or, or phrases like that um, when your mind believes something to the contrary. It would be like you know having a cake and putting lots of, of sweet sugar flowers and a sweet icing on top and and saying all is love, all is love, but there's a cake of mud uh, underneath. And when you slice through the cake and all the sweet icing is just dark mud and dirt, uh, you have to clear that away. So it's it's much more practical to be authentic. Mm -hmm. And and when people come to me and say, David, I know the world's illusion, but I'll say, no, you've got it backwards there. It's, it's more practical to start out. I think the world is real, but I'm willing to be shown. I'm willing to have an experience that shows me otherwise.
Otherwise, it's just a, a, another ego trick. I know the world's real but, and then fill in the blank. You know, it's just a denial statement, because the but contradicts. You don't need a but. If, if you know the world's unreal, then that's, that's a glorious uh, state of mind. You know love is real, but the but it gives it away. It shows there's a contradiction in there. Yeah. Yes, well to the world, sin is real, and mistakes are real, and errors are real, and they first must be pointed out, and spotted, and, and discovered. And then through some kind of hocus pocus of mind, or great uh, blessing from a mystic, or a saint, or from God, or from Jesus, it's supposed to absolve you. Uh, very much like uh, going to a confessional you know, in the Catholic Church and, and confessing your sins and then being absolved by a holy priest who says, you are absolved, my, my child. Uh, the Course is teaching that you forgive your brother, you forgive your sister for what they have not done. And so instead of making errors real and saying, you've done this terrible behavior, you've done this action, you've done this terrible thing, now we're going to work together to try to find healing, uh, it sees that uh, it was a misperception. So a misperception means that you've completely uh, misperceived what seemed to occur, and that it was all in your own mind, and that you're simply releasing an, a misperception from your own mind. And so therefore forgiveness is always a gift to yourself, because you're freeing your mind of misperceptions. Whereas in the world, Forgiveness seems to be personal. Uh, it may involve apologies. Uh, when you can go back to the, the movie Love Story, which is a famous line from the movie Love Story, love is never having to say you're sorry. <laughs> uh, this is more in alignment with true forgiveness because uh, apologies admit uh, that there's been an error done wrong to somebody. And it's almost like you're saying, I'm sorry. Sorry for what I did. True forgiveness goes in and you realize you were completely mistaken about the offense, about what you per were perceiving, and thereby you release that perception and you free everyone. Of course, you free your mind uh, from the misperception. So it really requires that you realize that there are no problems apart from the mind, which is a key idea in A Course in Miracles, because you can't really forgive a problem that that you believe is in form, because you've already put it out there, so to speak, you've put it outside of your mind. Yeah, it's, it's really that the, the physicality, all those interactions between bodies, in truth, in reality, in eternity, have not occurred. And one way you could look at this is, uh, the belief, first of all, in linear time, that, that all those bodies acting out on a stage, it's a very linear stage, you know, it's a, th a three-dimensional stage where there's actions and reactions, there's people talking and doing things and other people reacting and responding, uh, even like an interview where you have an interviewer and an interviewee, you know, that's all in the stage of time. And the teachings are is that time itself is an illusion. So that's why when you really forgive from the deepest perspective, you would say first you come to a, an awareness that the time is simultaneous instead of linear. If it's all happening at the same time, that, that's a very different perception than strong. the whole cosmos, all of history is, is concluded. <laughs> it was over the instant it started. That again is mind-boggling, mind mind-blowing, and it just shows you how deep it goes. But it does give you a little bit of a context so that when you're perceiving that somebody has mistreated you or, or harmed you, or even that things have occurred in the world on a big scale, you know, like the Holocaust or uh, genocides and so on and so forth, that, that you have a context for true forgiveness, 
which is, okay, I need to learn to forgive the belief in time, uh, and that it takes time to wake up to God. It takes time to heal, you know. Those are still journey. beliefs. A journey without distance, yeah. Yeah. It's deep. <laughs> it's really deep. You could say that it doesn't uh, break, thing, break the world apart and say that some are projections and some are extensions. It's saying that the very process of image making, of seeming to perceive images, is part of the projection. Just like if you went to a movie theater and you, you know, had this bright light in the projector and you, start, you put the film in on the roll and you started running the film, that those images would be projected onto the entire screen. And so, in psychological terms, you know, those of people who have studied psychology talk about projection as more of a dynamic of trying to get rid of something, to see something in another person instead of recognizing it in yourself. It seems very interpersonal, like it's just some kind of psychological, interpersonal dynamic, like denial or repression, projection. The Course is saying, no, your entire cosmos, the planets, the stars, everything that you see, the sun, the moon, the people, the mountains, the trees, the lakes, the ants, the animals, the people, the everything is a projection. And you're trying to see outside what you've denied within. So I always say, if you spot it, you got it. It doesn't matter what it is. You see a lazy neighbor, uh, you see an arrogant politician, you see an angry uh, uh, general or a war uh, monger or something, you know, and, and you say, that's terrible. But it starts with a belief and a belief system in the mind, and then you perceive in the world what you believe. So projection makes perception. The very way that the world seems to arise in awareness is coming by projection. And that's why you have to, in the end, heal or clear away all of those ego thoughts and beliefs before you can see a purified projection or a happy dream or the, what the Course calls the real world. Yeah. The same world that Jesus saw when he was on the cross and seemingly through his mind could you know, speak the words, forgive them for they know not what they do, it seemed unbelievable, incredible that, that someone could say that when there's spikes going into their arms and legs, but with this healed perception, of course, it's just about love and forgiveness. Well, it, of course, says God takes the final step, and once the world gets so bright and so happy and so f reflecting love, that you might say that then you're ready for the disappearance of the universe. And that's the disappearance of perception. And what comes with the disappearance of perception is the mind is returned to creation, which is pure abstraction, pure abstract love and light. So when there's no more film, no more guilt, no more world, then all is universal love and